Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Jonathan Tottle. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thank you. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Jonathan is an investor, a speaker, and upcoming author. Uh, he's a creative problem solver while ethically serving others first. Uh, he is a fund manager at Midwest Park Capital, a mobile home park fund. Uh, and so we're going to dive in today on mobile home parks and this fund that he's operating and even some COVID stuff. And I'm and, uh, just interested to hear more about Jonathan's story and then just also how this, how this portfolio has performed during uh, the pandemic and, and this mess that we've all been working through. So uh, Jonathan, welcome again to the show. Uh, give the listeners a little more about who you are and let's jump into just your superpower and your, you know, managing this fund and just mobile home parks during the pandemic. Sure. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. So I've been Fortunate enough, my dad was uh, really into the real estate game. Uh, he was a general contractor for 75 custom homes. So as a kid, I was always seeing houses from the ground up. Uh, he also had three real estate brokerage offices, which he owned and managed. Uh, and additionally, he bought commercial real estate. So I pretty much from like being a little kid, when everyone else was playing in the playground, I was playing on properties. <laughs> so which kind of gives you like a good perspective and seeing that. And this is especially because I grew up in the 80s. And we saw like, you know, the turbulent times, which just kind of correlates to today, you know, with what's going on with COVID and the challenges. So being able to survive different real estate cycles, it, was, it kind of gives you a unique perspective. And I'm just fortunate enough to have that background from my dad. And that's why it got me into mobile home parks. He got his first park about 15 years ago before it became like a big trend, as you're starting to see now with like Wall Street. Uh, I used to tell my friends, I'm like, hey, I'm just, I want to invest in mobile home parks. They're like, what are you talking about? What is that? <laughs> You know, now it's becoming kind of commonplace with Wall Street and Sam Zahn, Warren Buffett in this space. But back then it was kind of like, you, you know, what are you talking about? But as, as of today, it's been, uh, it's been a good journey. So. It's interesting to see the, the mindset of mobile home park shift a little bit, right? I mean, yep. it's, it was, it was like this thing of what in the world would you want to own one of those for? I mean, you know, you're crazy, right? Yep. Uh, and now so many people are trying to get into that space. Uh, well, let's talk about, you know, your fund a little bit and, and talk about, you know, even why you have a fund versus, you know, doing ind individual syndications. Uh, let's just start right there. Sure. Sure. Yeah. We actually have in our family of two parks. We, we used to have three. We saw one, we had an offer we couldn't refuse. Uh, I just wanted to scale faster uh, with, you know, I think we have like a five or six year run, which correlates to what you just said, because everyone is trying to get in this space because it's been performing so well. Uh, so like it's typically mom and pop owners, only about two or three institutionally owning, but that's going to drastically change over the next five or seven years. So we're trying to get as many parks as possible. It's not like something like, oh, I'll buy a park now and then five years, buy another park and then another five years after that, because most of these are once in a lifetime deals. So it's like, to ramp up speed to execution time is now like we have a five-year run i think to acquire as many parts before the cap rates get compressed they've come down just to give you a little context 10 years ago cap rates were you know 10 10 cap was commonplace and if it was like a coastal or you know how to market or better markets a, a cap now a cap is like rare midwest still has the a caps but if you're like closer to major metros you're still in the six six and a half cap and so now you're approaching multifamily and that's what's really changed. But luckily we've been one fortunate angle is uh, Fannie and Freddie are really, really, they're about 50% of all loans right now for in terms of value. So we never had that financing 10 years ago. So if you had a bank loan, obviously, a, no, let's say it's five, then you have an eight cap, okay, you have a three point spread. But now you have a six and a half cap and you get a three and a half Fannie and Freddie, you still have that three spread. So the cap rates, even though it sounds worse, at least you have that spread. And if you have that spread, a three point spread, you're going to get cash and cash in the teens. Uh, and also another value too, with mobile home parks is the land depreciation. Like you can't depreciate land, but you could depreciate the land, the improvements in all mobile home parks. If you're just mostly running like a land lease, the lots, the, the concrete, you mostly have concrete and that's where the homes sit on. Plus like the fencing. So you could depreciate around 65, 75% when you first acquire plus bonus depreciation. So it's a pretty attractive uh, uh, asset class right now because of all these like hidden benefits, basically. 
For sure. Wow. Yeah, I know it's definitely gaining in popularity like we've talked about. Uh, well, let's talk about your uh, your fund a little bit, your parks, uh, you know, and what's happened over the last, uh, you know, year, we'll say, uh, maybe where you were at, you know, last uh, November, December, and then, uh, you know, compared to March and then June and, you know, kind of walk us through what, you know, how COVID, you know, affected your your properties and, and your mobile home parks specifically. Well, the, it's definitely... I mean, it's kind of shocked everyone in this world. That's the first thing. I feel bad for some asset classes. We, unfortunately, we, this, over the last 50 years, mobile home parks have been the, the lowest default rate based on bank data. Self-storage was a close second, but they actually got affected this year also because they got overbuilt. So now that, I mean, I like all asset classes in some way or form, but the one advantage to us is for our parks, we didn't see maybe one or two people paid like a couple weeks late, but uh, then again, our average rents three hundred dollars for our personal parks, and they had the the stimulus, uh, which helped. And even if that didn't come, we have a mostly senior parks, so a senior. Uh, so they got the social securities, and then like their their rent to expense ratio is up way below it. So that that's one of the advantage of this industry is we have a, a lot of the focus is on seniors and the baby boomers. Is ten thousand retiring every day? They usually you know just on social security as small savings. We're the only affordable option, and. If you look at how government looks at when you, like if you went to get a house, you want to have one third payment down. It's basically, they want to see that spread. We're one third of apartment price or one half apartment, one third of a house. So even if it's three or $400 lot rent, or if they work $10 an hour, we still serve that need. Um, and there was just a study, I don't know by the time you see this, but about three days ago or six days ago now, sorry, Green Street, which does data. Uh, for all the commercial real estate assets, pretty much all institutional data and it, in, industrial and mobile home parks are the only two that have actually gone up in value this year. We've gone up about 8%. Uh, and you've seen double digits negative for obviously like malls because of e-commerce, you can't go in the mall, retail, lodging, uh, some other asset classes over like six to 8% in, uh, decrease in value. And we've seen an 8% increase in value. Uh, so it's been, and it's just been fascinating to see like, this is what we've been preaching for the last couple of years that we are recession resilient, or at least the last 10 years. And now we actually have, you know, the data, the backstop wall street journal did an article in February of this year, 2020, by the time it's there, it's been, you know, previous year, but uh, over the last, since the last downturn, mobile home parks were the best performing real estate asset class. It's a wall street journal article. Uh, it mainly just comes down to supply and demand. There's 60 million Americans need affordable housing. There's 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. People are, you know, the spending power, inflation, all that works to our advantage. And we're the only thing that can solve that problem. And the only problem is there's only 12 million mobile homes and 44,000 lots. So there's this huge demand, but there's not enough supply. And that's they're not the, really building more mobile home parks, right? Correct. And that's the biggest thing. It's like, and once you have one, it's kind of like, uh, it's like a gold mine, basically. You want to solve the affordable housing, provide a, you know, ethical, safe place to live and fair pricing. You still have to maintain it, like, there's still costs involved with that, obviously, because uh, we tell some people like, oh, you're, you know, that's so much lot rent for that. But well, yeah, we have to maintain the grounds. We have to maintain the sewer lines. We have to maintain all that. And plus, we pay the bulk of the taxes. So if we didn't, if these get torn down, which is about a certain percentage get torn down every year, this place, people don't have a place to live. So we look at it as like, hey, we're providing an affordable place. We, we do the cap backs when you come in. We make sure the improvements bring more amenities, bring everything up to speed and they have a better quality of life. And we're really passionate about that. Uh, but also serving that affordable housing. And it's, there was also, I forgot what data was, that 93% collection of rent during the worst part of COVID in March and April institutional data. So when everything else, I heard some like certain asset classes got down to 70, 75. It was about a 93% collection rate based on uh, the data. Wells Fargo did a report on that too, as well, their commercial lending. So pretty wow. crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, can you just speak a, you know, a little more? To, was there a way that your fund or your parks were better prepared for a downturn or better prepared for COVID? I know mobile home parks, you know, in general, you talk about, you know, how they're, they're just more resilient, you know, uh, but anything that, uh, were there anything specific that you were doing even beforehand that have helped you to just minimize, uh, you know, any kind of uh, internal downturn, you know, for in those parks? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So Midwest Park Capital and our, and our parks personally too, we always try to buy parts that are more like we want to, we don't want to turn around parts. We're not trying to come in and say, Hey, we got to completely turn it around. Like there's obviously opportunity for it. And there's a lot of upside, but it's a lot more boots in the ground that 
uh, and just more work and running out all the units and you know bringing in new units. We we try to identify like better opportunities. They're already well positioned. They're already you know top tier. You know demand. The, you know the the parks that people really demand. We're not trying to get a park that's you know in the middle of nowhere with no chance of getting the <laughs> residents in there. And there is parks like that. Uh, so first, you know, acquiring the right park. Second, like you, when you, you look at parks, do the correct due diligence. Uh, and it's, it's a whole long process. I don't want to go into too details on that, but make sure you do the correct due diligence. Uh, marketing, we use a lot of like Facebook marketing. Uh, marketing really makes a difference because if you, we're competing with a lot of mom and pops, like I mentioned, it's mostly mom and pops and most of them don't know how to use Facebook. <laughs> so if everyone is on Facebook now, to, I don't know how many billions of people are on Facebook, Facebook marketplace is free way to market, you know, uh, units. And it was really, really effective and it's very cost. I mean, if you're not paying anything for it, you could boost it, but most of the time you just put it on there and you get 20, 30 calls on a unit if you're selling or running them. So just having that, you know, tech, you know, especially now with everyone in COVID, they're online looking at properties. We even, you'd be surprised. Like I've even had like 65, seven year olds like, Oh, thank you. I saw that in Facebook marketplace. I'm like, so everyone's on it. You just, you know, you're just getting in front of more audiences and able to feel to keep the parks maintained and keep the demand there. And then just being really efficient with the management. Yeah. Uh, what are some maybe different things that, that you do, uh, you know, when managing your properties that maybe other mobile home park operators do not that just help you to stand out or, or rise above? Yeah, we, uh, we use a third party manager called M Shapiro. They're the biggest operator. They have about 35,000 lots. They manage Apollo's groups as well, which is a, one of the biggest private equities in the world. Uh, plus a 30 year history. So having the right team, we have a, a seasoned park CPA that just he works with another fund, but has been in it for 20 years, having really like an all-star team and not just, you know, not cutting corners, making sure we have an all-star team, everything from the management to the CPA. Uh, and then, like I said, it comes down to like acquiring parks. It's a lot of industry relationships. I've been in the space 15 years. Uh, I was one of the, supposed to be one of the speakers in the national expo with Dr. Ben Carson and then the Clayton Homes, which is the biggest manufacturer of mobile homes. One of those is one of the 12 speakers this year, but obviously COVID went to digital and digital was like a small segment. <laughs> so hopefully I'll be on the speaking stage next year. But what that means is I have a lot of industry relationships. We get, off, we get deals that people don't see. Like a lot of the stuff, because it is supply and demand, they want to work with people they know, like, and trust and have been in the business. It's a lot easier for somebody like us to get better deals and somebody just come in the space like, hey, I heard about mobile home parks and we put the years in, so they trust us now. They're they're playing catch up to us. So nice. No, yeah. I mean, the team is so important in whatever business you're in, especially in real yeah. estate. Um, you know, what you said, uh, who is the management company again? M Shapiro. They're out of Michigan. Nice. Yeah, and and are there what what's your criteria now for when you're finding a mobile home park? Is there specific sizes, locations? What are you know, are you just anywhere in the country? How are you finding those deals and what's your criteria? Yeah, for Midwest Park Capital, we focus on 75 to 250 units. Uh, it's better for scale of economics, efficiencies. Uh, we like Midwest. Midwest has about a one to two points at a minimum higher cap rate. As coastal cities is more institutional private equity and like they're bidding it down. Obviously, they have access to capital way cheaper than we can. Um, so we focus in the Midwest. We also like Tennessee and Texas because, you know, the growing economies, people are flocking there in droves. Uh, so we like the Midwest focus for that reason, 75, 250, most of the parks were acquiring 70, 70, 1970 to 1990, because there really hasn't been that many developments as you alluded to in the last 20, 30 years, it's almost impossible to develop it from a ground up and the problem with ground up development, if you get one of the few people a year that gets it, luckily you have to buy, you're basically developing a subdivision from the ground up. You're not buying a cash flowing asset. Like if you buy an apartment building or you buy a self storage and they already have tenants in place and you know, rent rolls coming in. You're literally building up, putting eighty thousand dollars per pad, plus you know the info, the marketing, the approval. You're not even making a profit for like three or four years. And we're trying to be, and you know our philosophy is let's buy some as cash flow right now, prove the efficiencies. If we could, oh, mention uh, build back the water and sewer. That's one rate, huge way if it's allowed to increase the, uh, the you know the NOI. Uh, also, just really bring in the, like just really market or marketing efficiencies and management efficiencies. And that really separates it. Because remember, a lot of these people that have owned it had for 30, 40 years, and sometimes they're, you know, they're living in a small town or tertiary market. They have like a four or $5 million mobile home that they've paid off. They're making four or 500,000 revenue. 
they're not sitting here trying to maximize it every little dollar. Sometimes they haven't raised the rent in like 15 years because they're like, I already have half a million dollars. I live in a town where the, the average income is like 30 grand. Like they don't need those to maximize it. So nice. No, that's some great criteria. I appreciate you just elaborating on that. And you know, it's the economies of scale, 75 to 250 units for sure. Um, you know, what about, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, or I think uh, it just in some, uh, uh, before we even started to, uh, recording the show, you mentioned, some, you know, just like the most popular real estate niche in 2021. Uh, you know, why is that? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to be writing an article in Forbes about this. It's literally just the supply and demand. We're seeing so much migration from other asset classes and people inquiring uh, from, you know, that they're in retail, especially retail, hospitality, and lodging. We're seeing like, hey, like, it almost feels like they're quizzing us to like, see if they could start their own. But it's because they've been, you know, so affected by COVID, unfortunately. And we've been, we just have the supply and demand to our advantage. Uh, it's, it's just, it's got some unique oddities to it. You know, the whole thing we want to do is basically just own the land and rent the units out. And, it, and when you have less to work with, it makes it a lot more efficient. There's still challenges. People say, oh, you just want land, but no, there's still challenges. Still got to market. You still have to train the staff correctly. The, the, you know, the hidden challenges are like, if trees fall down, so you have to make sure the trees aren't coming down on the houses. Like that's a big issue. If like, if they're not tree trends all of a sudden it comes down in this mobile home. It's basically just like a shoebox. There's no low bearing walls on the inside. It's just like the outside to come down. You have to basically replace the unit. It's, it's gone. Uh, but I mean, then that's when you, you know, as an experienced operator, you know that you come in first thing you do. And you also use that in your price negotiation. Like, Hey, these trees haven't been trimmed for 20 years. That's going to cost, you know, X per tree based on what it is. We need to knock this price down. So Jonathan, what's been the hardest part of the syndication business for you? The great question. Right now, the, the biggest hard, hardest part is, is our first fund. So like the, even though I've got track record, it's more like people want to see, uh, you know, it's getting past that hurdle. So main thing is we got to come in. We're just say, basically saying here, we built an all-star team. We have the best property management. We have the best CPA. Our fund software has $100 billion under assets under management, and they manage uh, parallel groups. Uh, so we've really picked and choose, and I've been in the space 15 years. Uh, one thing I've been disadvantaged too is all the trade shows that I normally we would have booths at, and we'd take people out to dinner. These are all canceled, so we're doing a lot of virtually. And then who our core audience is, you know, credit investors, high net worth. Yeah, yeah. There's different areas of for season. People are seasoned with Zoom, but you also have a demographic, a, a large percentage of credit investors that are still phone calls. So it's more like, hey, I want to see you face to face, but they don't know how to use Zoom. So instead of like, hey, let's go out to dinner, you know, bring your friends and family, we can't do that. So we had to like, we, we, we made a focal point of focusing on digital, but the most affluent people that, are, that we normally have access to, it's, it's, we don't have that full access. We can't take them to trade show. We can't go to a trade show. We can't take them out to dinner. So I think that hopefully will change next year because we want to do a couple more funds as well uh, where we can still get people face to face. And that's how you really build, you know, build trust with people. Has has COVID changed the way that maybe you prepare for a downturn or another downturn in the future? We are doing the same position because it's our, our asset class is fortunately aligns with COVID. It's almost like the COVID killer, I guess you call it. Uh, so it hasn't affected us in that regard. Like I said, the rent rolls there, the values of properties have gone up. There was a recent Bloomberg article, it was like 23% increase in some values of some, they were saying some communities like the institutional properties. So it actually... That's the biggest thing is, I guess to answer your question is the biggest thing is uh, keep focusing on the Midwest because we have the higher cap rates because the compression is going to keep going down. If it starts going below like five, five and a half cap and it's like, okay, it's, you're not getting that nice team spread on, you know, cash and cash. So then it becomes, okay, this is, I guess you look at it comparatively, like rather have a cash flow, but you're not going to be, uh, you know, you're not going to get that nice return right off the bat. So you're going to have to do a lot of like management. You're going to have to find different angles to make it really an attractive asset long-term. Luckily we're not in that position right now. And I think the Midwest has, like I said, a four or five more year run, but five years from now, this is probably going to be in a, like a normal asset class, like multifamily. That's where it's kind of headed to. So. Jonathan, I believe anyone that's successful in business and in, in real estate for sure has a high level of self-discipline. How did you gain such a high level of self-discipline? Um, lots of mentors. I've always reached out, pay for, always pay for speed to execution. So when I first started out, I'd go to rooms where I'd be like nervous and be the most successful people, but you pick that up. And then at the same time on my free time, I read like last year, for example, I read over hundred, about 115 books. 
but it was through audiobook. So when I work out every morning for an hour and a half, an average audiobook is six hours. So you get it, you get 50 books a year just by going to the gym. Like literally audiobooks, just put it on there, hit the treadmill, listen to the audiobook, and at night I put an audiobook in there. So that gets my foundation. So when you do go to these rooms, when I first start out, I at least would have knowledge and I'd have speaking points that could say it's worth their time to actually converse with me. So the, the bigger rooms you get into are the, the more successful people, which I deal with a lot of very high net worth people now, they'll actually have 45 minute hour conversations because we have, we can, we can you know, go back and forth and then they're not wasting their time, but there wasn't any value there. So literally just putting that the framework in of like, this is going to be a long journey. You're going to have to take time to build trust. You have to, you know, pay mentors, learn from the best, you know, and then just keep continuous education. And that's over time that compounds and that builds that, that strength and that builds that, uh, you know, that entrepreneur basically skills that you need to have. And that, you know, fuels you at the end of the day. Did you say 115 books? Yeah. Sounds crazy, but it is. Yeah. So I did about wow. 50 like audiobooks. I know you scribe. The app is eight bucks a month. They started throttling me after you do like six or eight books a month. And the rest is Who's that? Is it Audible or what was it? No, Scribed. It's way better. Scribed. It has pretty much the same selection. It's A Bucks Unlimited, but then they throttle you. I'm like a power reader. So I told them, like, how about you just charge me like four times the amount and I could do, you know, 10, 15 bucks a month. So, but it's A Buck uh, Unlimited Audiobooks. So I know some people like to put in in faster speed, but I just put on that and, and it just gives you like a foundation. So I, I read like a lot of technology books. I read a lot of like the, right now I'm big into like history. I like, uh, of successful entrepreneurs like Sam Zell, uh, you know, Henry Ford, Walt Disney, like some of the old classic guys and hear their challenges and also how they went through and endured and succeeded. So it kind of gives you a foundation of like what others had to do to get to that point. Are any daily habits, maybe obviously this is one of them, but any daily habits that you're disciplined about that have helped you achieve success? Definitely working out. I think uh, last year I kind of neglected that a little bit or actually at the beginning of the year when the gyms are closed because of COVID. Uh, but just incorporating the, you know, the cardio at least or, tre- or stretching, it also helps de-stress you, gets the blood flowing, gets you like energized for the morning. If you don't have that, you drink like four or five cups of coffee and then you have that lag in the middle of the day. But if you do that workout in the morning, I think it definitely feels you. Know, even if you could just do anything that, you know, if it's weights, if it's yoga, it's something that you could do, but at least you're doing something active in the morning. I think that really sets this tone for the day and gets you going in the right direction. Uh, what's a way you've recently improved your business that we could apply to our business? I think just really focusing on digital. Like I said, like, uh, like definitely websites, SEO, having just a really tech forward because everything is digital right now. So we really invested that when we first started out and I've been a really big advocate for the last four or five years in you know, digital and tech. But now this year, it's like, that was a great move because everything from this point on, they said, we've kind of... Uh, even with e-commerce, they said we've kind of moved forward like five years because of COVID. So things that would, they were kind of predicting from 2025 are kind of happening now because everyone's working from home or everything's online. So having that online focus first was a huge advantage to us. I know you briefly talked about this a little bit about meeting people and networking, uh, but what's your best source right, right now for meeting new investors? Best source, Facebook. Facebook and uh, just online marketing. Is there a specific way you're doing online marketing? Facebook ads. Facebook ads. So paid ads on Facebook. Uh, It's a lot more efficient. Google ads got, we've used Google ads too, but we, the Facebook ads have been the most effective. And then we also, if you Google like mobile home park investment fund or mobile home park investment companies, money managed mobile home park, we're like number one or two in every keyword. So we get a lot of like real high value people from that. Those are actually the highest value because we're organic and like the major keywords in our industry and uh, which is pretty cool. So that helps out a lot. What's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? I, uh, great question. I think the number one thing is just endless tenacity, never giving up and constantly reinvesting myself and continuing to learn and just keep pushing forward. I think as entrepreneurs, business people, and real estate investors, uh, you know, as a, all your audience and you are, is just keep being tenacious and keep adding value and keep improving and just giving back at the end of the day. And how do you like to give back? I've done a few different charity boards in Chicago. So I have uh, one I'm kind of known for my dog's birthday. It's called the Brownie Birthday Bash. <laughs> so we do, uh, we didn't do it the last two years because he's a Dotson. They have, you know, dog problems with the, the back problems, I should say. Uh, but we did five straight years where we do events and we do all the money goes to, we'd run out like a, a venue in the Chicago and the River North, which is like the trendy area. And we raise the money and they go to homeless dogs and we bring dogs in there and dogs will get adopted from that. I also sat in the Chicago Chef's Hall of Fame for five years too, which... 
a portion of that was to give back to culinary students that couldn't afford going to school. I sat on a, a couple other different boards in Chicago. And then this year, or 2021, by the time this airs, the next summer, we're going to start a 501c3 for uh, people in the, our mobile home parks to help them. We're trying to think of ways to help them. You know, if they're, they're just paying their payments, and they need some money, the kids need some toys or supplies or something like that. So we're going to start a, a charity event just to help those in need as well. Nice. Well, Jonathan, it's been a pleasure to get to know you better and to have you on the show and just really hear about your fund and mobile home parks in general and how, how they've, they're, they're resilient you know, through this pandemic and, and through uh, even future pandemics. So, and how that, you know, you haven't really had to change much because you've already had those things in place uh, and, and just how your, that business is growing and, and how you're scaling that 75, 250 units at a time. That's going to scale pretty fast, right? Uh, you know, buying properties like that. So, uh, but great to get to know you. How can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you yeah it's been great being on here uh, facebook just go to jonathan tuttle official on facebook the mobile home park fund midwest park capital so it's midwest park capital just how it sounds and then if they're if they're ready to more like farther down if they're looking to see the ppm the private placement go midwest park capital fund.com uh, or a33 mhp fund <laughs> We got that. I don't know how we got it, but it's pretty cool. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.